do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I swear. Mr. Storma is an expert biometric scientist in the field of dactyloscopy, the study of fingerprints. He'll be joining us from his office in the Houston Police Department's fingerprint lab. Mr. Storma, please connect your video connection for the court. Judge Jackson, is the video connection visible? Yes, Mr. Storma. You are free to proceed with your expert testimony. Please inform the jury of the Gonzalez case of your findings and expertise on the study of fingerprints. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I would like to offer you a brief roadmap of my testimony. I'd like to begin by addressing the history of fingerprinting, followed with an explanation of the multiple aspects of fingerprinting that make dactyloscopy germane and conclusive as forensic tools in court, and explain the results of our tests, providing you with enough conclusive evidence to convict our defendant, Mr. Johnson. So let me begin by discussing a brief history of fingerprinting. Fingerprints have been used for identification purposes since the years of ancient China and Babylon, where officials used thumbprints as signatures on documents. The Persian government of the 14th century declared that no two fingerprints are alike, and today we still find this to be a valid statement. In 1880, Dr. Henry Faltz found that he could link a fingerprint from a laboratory bottle to that of one of his assistants, and from there created a classification system. Sir Francis Galton later studied Faltz's work and provided the first scientific proof that the odds of finding two identical prints surfacing on the planet is 1 in 64 billion, thus proving that no two fingerprints are alike. He also found that fingerprints do not change over the course of a person's lifetime. In 1896, the first fingerprint database was created, and in 1980, the first computer database for fingerprint identification was put into place. Today, there are nearly 700 million fingerprints in the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, or APHIS system. Now, let me tie this history to the implication of fingerprinting in today's investigations, starting with universality. All people have fingerprints, with the exception of those who do not have fingers, and ridge patterns are found on palms, toes, and fingers, and these ridge patterns are what comprise a fingerprint. Since all people have fingerprints, many would think that fingerprints are not unique. However, all fingerprints are unique. As I explained with the history of fingerprints, the odds of finding two people with the same fingerprint, as in one fingerprint, not all ten, is one in 64 billion. Fingerprints are composed of three typical patterns called loops, arches, and whorls, and from there they are identified by their minutiae. Bifurcations, or forks, deltas, and scars are just examples of the many minutiae that make fingerprints unique. Fingerprints are permanent to a person. They do not change over time, thus making them an identifier to that person. Fingerprints found at a crime scene can last up to years if they are not tampered with. Fingerprint ridges leave oils, fats, amino acids, and even residue from anything one comes in contact with. And these residues can last for a very long time, which helps investigators when working on a crime scene for long periods of time. When collecting fingerprints at a crime scene, there are many different methods to collect them. For example, fingerprints left on paper or porous surfaces can be collected using an anhydrin spray, which reacts with amino acids to form a purple-colored print. Prints left on imprintable surfaces such as putty can be collected through molding and casting. When it comes to surfaces such as glass, investigators can either dust and lift the print, or use another method called cyanoacrylate fuming to form the print. Nearly every object can be searched for fingerprints. When it comes to specific case, we use dusting and lifting methods on the assault weapon, the broken glass bottle. Prints are also collected from the suspects through an inked method and then compared to those found at the crime scene. Now let me move on to the performance. The performance of the systems and experts is definitely an important aspect when comparing prints. Electronic matching is very effective and has little margin of error, according to the FBI's information about the APHIS system. Now, matching done by experts has been shown to have an extremely low false positive rate, thus creating no reasonable doubt for a positive match. However, there is a slightly higher rate of false negatives when matching by experts, which would result in allowing a guilty man to go free. Statistically, combining the two low rates of failure, given that an average rate of error for a false positive is around 0.1%, and multiplying that percentage with a low margin of error for the APHIS system, combining the two creates an accuracy rate of over 99.9%. So what usually makes a fingerprint match acceptable in court? Now, criminal investigations tend to use both the APHIS and expert testimony when providing a match in court. The acceptability for a print has changed over time due to the increasing probabilities of multiple minutiae matching and multiple fingerprints. For this reason, 8 to 12 minutiae matches must be made between two prints for nearly all courts to accept the testimony as credible evidence. 
and some courts even require 16 matching points. This is enough for a match to remove reasonable doubt. However, there are ways to circumvent the system, but criminal investigations have many checks to this method. Due to the fact that some matching systems are automated, they are susceptible to mistakes or hackers who can theoretically change the owner of a fingerprint on the database. For this reason, APHIS has very strict security, and every match is checked a final time by an expert in dactyloscopy. This personal check leads me to the concerns and issues with fingerprinting in forensic investigations. There are many issues that one can come across whenever trying to get a match from fingerprints. Whenever collecting a fingerprint from the crime scene, there's always a possibility of messing up and tampering the fingerprint whenever trying to collect it from, let's say, a glass bottle. When you have a glass bottle like this, you usually collect the print using a tape method after dusting. However, Smudging the print would leave a print that's harder to actually analyze. Um, having a smudged print can make the comparison very difficult for investigators and dactyloscopic experts. Now, whenever we look at two different prints, we have to have enough points of reference to have 8 to 12 minutia comparisons that show a match. So, the issue and concern with uh, dactyloscopy and collecting fingerprints is having enough minutia from the fingerprint gathered from the crime scene in order to make that comparison with the fingerprint from the suspect. So let me elaborate a little bit more about identity theft and fingerprints. It is nearly impossible for someone to steal another individual's fingerprints, and every fingerprint, as I have told you, is unique. For example, even twins who are identical genetically and in appearance have different fingerprints. In the past, it was possible to copy another person's fingerprints to get through security scanners by simply using a photocopy. With the advancements of fingerprinting technology and security today, it is nearly impossible to steal someone's identity with fingerprints. For this reason, when we look to the case at hand, the fingerprint analysis offers conclusive evidence that Mr. Johnson was in fact the assailant. Thank you, Mr. Strava. That was all very interesting. You seem to know quite a bit about fingerprinting. Could you please tell us how your findings relate to this case? Yes, ma'am. Let's look at the situation at hand. Miss Gonzalez, the president of the Homeowners Association, hosted a party with many of her neighbors. At the party, Miss Gonzalez was struck with a glass bottle on the back of the head while putting on her makeup in her bathroom, and then stabbed twice before the assailant fled the scene. In the kitchen, two of the women at the party were preparing appetizers. As soon as Miss Honey Boo Boo heard the glass shatter, she immediately ran to the bathroom door and knocked to see what was wrong. She heard a window open and did not see the assailant. She recalls not knowing the whereabouts of three of the other guests at the time, including Mr. Johnson, Miss Johnson, and Miss Jambalaya, but does remember the three of them discussing how angry they were that Miss Gonzalez would not allow them to farm ostriches in their backyards. The investigator at the scene, after questioning the guests and studying the scene, determined those three people as the prime suspects. The jury knows the case, Mr. Stormer. Please explain your lab results. Yes, ma'am. After analyzing all of the prints of the suspects, we quickly eliminated all of the prints except for that of Mr. Johnson's right thumb, because of the rarity of the whirl pattern such as this. Now, logically, let's look at the way one would hold a bottle when using it to strike another person or object. The placement of your hand on the bottle leaves the thumb exactly in the location where we found the print on the bottle from the crime scene. We asked what was Mr. Johnson's dominant hand, and he re responded with the right hand. Now, whenever we analyze the print of the actual bottle, we could see that on the bottle, how, he, how one would hold it, he would have the patterns of the pinky, the ring finger, the middle finger, and the index finger exactly in line like this with the thumbprint where it was right here. All of these facts, after looking at Mr. Johnson's hands, uh, point to Mr. Johnson being the assailant. But in order to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Johnson was the person holding the bottle, we must compare the minutiae of the fingerprint from the scene to the minutiae of the fingerprint from Mr. Johnson's right thumb. As you can see, I have pointed out over 12 points of similarity between the two points. Right here, we have Mr. Johnson's right thumb, if you can see that. And right here, we have the fingerprint found on the glass bottle. Now, we can look at the fingerprint from the glass bottle. We can see, like I was pointing out with the collection methods and the issues and concerns, that there are some smudges here and there because, of course, it is a lot more tampered with than something that you would find 
uh, taken as an exact perfect print at the investigator's office. However, whenever we look at this, I have pointed out over 12 points of, uh, points of comparison. Um, all of these points are the exact same points that we can see on Dependent Johnson's right thumbprint right here. So after looking at all of these points, um, in my expert opinion as a certified dactyloscopy expert, right there, um, I'm thoroughly convinced that Mr. Johnson was in fact the assailant. Thank you, Mr. Stormer. The defense attorney would now like to question you for cross-examination.